I'm going to embarrass Jeff Buckingham real quick. Jeff, Jeff is going to Afghanistan next month to serve our nation, and I'd like you to write down his name on your program somewhere. Just write down Jeff, and I'd like you to remember him in your prayers as he takes off. I've known Jeff's parents since, well, they were about his age, since they were about Jeff's age, and so somewhere I was trying to do the math in my head as we were singing up here and trying to figure it out, but as he takes off, I remembered a year ago, I think this weekend, Sammy, his niece, was getting married, and we were there, and we were all standing around talking, and Jeff's daughter, who I don't remember her name, the little cute little gal with the, this, is, what? Thank you, okay, anyway, <laughs> like I could hear up here, anyway, um, anyway, I held her, and she had these insanely beautiful eyes and this vibrant brunette hair, you know, and I looked at her, and I said, Jeff, she is so beautiful. And this, like, angelic, miraculous look came across Jeff's face, and he said, it's amazing, isn't it? He says, it's just amazing, isn't it? And I don't know how it happens, but it's just amazing. And you saw this, this presence of a father. I mean, it's that look that only dad can get. And I think about how when we so often pray for our men and women in service, we don't have a name attached to it. And, you know, if you're one of those people who sends me things on Facebook and says, please pray for so-and-so if we get a million people to pray for this person, I want you to know, I don't believe in any of that stuff. Um, you know, God bless you, and if you forward it to me, I mean, thank you. But I don't do it because I don't think a million of us praying to God changes the heart of God any more than one of us praying to God. It's not like if all of us on the whole earth pray, that changes God anymore. You see, we pray to change us. God is unchangeable. He's unchanging, and God's wanting the best, and we pray to change us. And we have the opportunity, just like a year ago, I had the opportunity to find out more about Jeff, to see the love for his daughter, and to meet this beautiful little girl, and I'd already, you know, known his older son. And no, and, but, you know, it's just, it was, for me, it's easy to pray for Jeff. I remember when he was a teenager, an army guy, but anyway, I mean, it's easy for me as I go through this time to pray for Jeff. But if you write down his name, and as he heads out today, you don't have to salute him or anything like that, though he's probably deserving of it. Um, you know, but what you can do is just say, and he's the one sitting over by Tom and Ellen over there, um, just tell him, hey, Jeff, I want you to know I wrote down your name. I'm going to be praying for you. And it's a cool thing to do. Pray for Tom and Ellen during this time. Pray for Allison. Pray for the whole family. I mean, because how many of you know what it's like to send a family member off to a war zone? It's no fun, is it? There's just absolutely nothing fun about it. And so you pray just for the day that everyone's home again, and we're all celebrating that moment. And so pray for Jeff as he goes. He's going to be serving our nation, and that's a blessing. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you on behalf of everyone. I try not to embarrass you. Jeff's not going to come back for 20 more years. Yeah, I'm not walking in past your ex. going to embarrass me. I went to a church in Long Beach when I was growing up, and I left the church when I was about 17. My dad had been the pastor, and my dad resigned as a pastor when he was in his 50s. He retired. Can you imagine retiring in your 50s? I can't. Um, he started golfing and doing that kind of stuff, and I, I had no clue what that's like in my life now. I mean, to imagine that. And then in his 60s, he went back to the same little church. And I was 25 years old, and I felt a calling back to the church, and I went back to church. And during that time, at the age of 25, I found the Lord and it changed my life, and I went to the church for about a year, and then this little church in Bell Gardens, California, they were falling apart, and they started coming over to the church, and we were a church of maybe 50 or something like that in Long Beach at that point. The church had really fallen apart, and then the church of Bell Gardens was maybe 20 people that came over, and they came over, and they started coming in, and we used to sing this chorus that maybe you learned at some point in your life. You know, I said, I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. How many of you know that song? Three of us. Okay, good. Well, three of us know that song. It's an old song. It's a song where you kind of reimburse. We won't sing it all together. The joys of being a part of a small church, and small churches always sing that song. And one day, after about a month or two of this little church from Bell Gardens coming over, we were singing on a Wednesday night, and Wednesday night was the time where you had Bible study, and 15 people got together and said, let's sing song number 82, you know, and you turn to that song. And this guy named Bob Edge, who I didn't know at all from Bell Gardens Church, he stood up and he said, you know, I notice you guys always sing the chorus of that song. Do you know their verses? Where are they going? Their verses of that song? 
And he says, yeah, there are verses to that song. He said, do you mind if I sing one? No, go ahead. And he stood up just like he said, you will notice we say brother and sister round here. It's because we're a family and these folks are so dear. When one has a heartache, we all shed a tear and rejoice in each victory of this family so dear. I'm so glad I'm a... And then we would all join in together, and Bob literally looked around, oh, let's all sing together. And we all sang, you know. And he went verse after verse, and I can still see this skinny little guy, Bob Edge, with this voice about as bad as mine, standing there just singing, you know. Every single verse as we all jumped in on the courses. And I thought to myself, I was telling Ken the story about it. I said, Ken, did you ever do that? He said, you know, we used to do the same thing at the church we, I grew up in, except we would point at a different person in the church, and a different person in the church would need to sing that verse. Kind of like, Gene, you're up, second verse. I mean, it's like, kind of like that would be, you know, and suddenly, you know, you have to sing the verse, and Ken would say, that next person would sing the verse. I'm thinking, but you see, I came from a family that sang the verses. I came from a family that knew the verses. See, I know that most people come from families that know the courses. You know the tagline. You know what it's all about to be involved in the courses. But the verses? You don't know the verses to everything. I mean, when you go to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, you know all the verses. You know all five verses to a mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. I mean, you can preach the verses. You know all the verses, but the courses. And you think, I think so often in our spiritual walk, what we've come to know in Christianity is we've come to know the courses, but we don't know the verses of our life with God. And sadder still, we don't know the verses of the people who are sitting around us. We were driving to the streets the other night, and it was just Mark and Jody and I in the Jackets for Jesus van, and I had one of my playlists going real loudly, and that old song Lola by the Kinks came on. Maybe you've heard the song before. And you know, la 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 la. And I noticed that um, some of you have never heard that song either, huh? Boy, you don't know. I'm so glad I'm part of the family of God or Lola. That's crazy. <laughs> anyway, Lola, um, I noticed Jody knew all the words for the chorus, and Jody was singing along loudly as she went all the way through it. And Mark and I were kind of smirking and laughing. She didn't know the verses at all. And I said, you know, it's always kind of made me sad for people named Lola after this song came out. And Jody said, well, I love the name Lola. What do you think would be wrong with I said, well, I love the name too, but you know what this song's about, don't you, Jody? She said, I only know the verses to the chorus. And then we wondered if we should spoil the entire song for her by telling her that it was about a transvestite man who went by Lola, you know, and that's what the whole song was about and how, how this mysterious discovery was about to be happened in the verses. You see, it's in the verses. We discover the secrets about each other. It's in the verses that we discover the truth about each other. And all too often, we've never taken the time to know the verses about each other. All too often, We've never taken the time just to get to sit down. That's what I like about the picnic. The picnics give us the time to sit under the trees together. I was here until 11.30 last night pulling pork. I guarantee if nothing else, we've got the best pulled pork going on. But I also saw pans and pans of ribs in there. I, I mean, we have got good food for the picnic today. And so much food. You could stay with it. We've got dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of hot dogs that'll be on the grill. We've got so much good food. And we're going to have the opportunity to sit down underneath a tree and just share together. We've got a glorious water slide. Wouldn't it be fun if we all went on the water slide together? I mean, wouldn't that just be a blast to all go down the water slide at the same time? First service, everybody up the water slide! And we all slid down together. You see, for each of us, we have the opportunity. On the front of your card this morning, there's a story that I like to give away every single year on Picnic Sunday. It was written by Bob Benson. It's from his um, book, I think, Come to the House, the name of the book. But 
It's a great book that it's my favorite story, and it isn't this one, believe it or not. It's, it's called The Laughter in These Walls. And it talks about the laughter and the tears in the walls of the home that you put into it when we have the time just to be together. Um, and I would encourage you to just pick up that little book. You can get it on Amazon even still. But in this book, he talks about Sunday school picnics and on the story on the front of your card, and it just says, do you remember Sunday school picnics? He says, as I recall, it was back in the olden days, as my kids would say, back before they had air conditioning. They said, we'll all meet at Sycamore Lodge in Shelby Park at 4.30 on Saturday. You bring your supper, and we'll furnish the iced tea. Hey, we do that even still. You bring your supper, we'll supply all the paper goods, the products, and all the soda. It's all ready. It's all on ice out there. You bring the iced tea. But if you were like me, you came home at the last minute, when you got ready to pack your picnic, all you could find in the refrigerator was one dried up piece of bologna and just enough mustard in the bottom of a jar that you got at all of your knuckles trying to get to it. How many of you have ever had an empty refrigerator like that? You know, maybe that's the problem with the generation today with struggling. Maybe we just all have too much food. We just have way too much of it around. I mean, we don't know what it's like to have that old empty refrigerator. So you made your bologna sandwich and you wrapped it in an old brown bag and you went to the picnic. When it came time to eat, you sat at the end of a table and spread out your sandwich. But the folks who sat next to you brought a feast. The lady was a good cook, and she'd worked hard all day to get ready for the picnic. And she had fried chicken, and baked beans, and potato salad, and homemade rolls, and sliced tomatoes, and pickles, and olives. How many of you are hungry already just hearing this? I was going to say, and celery, Lord, help us. I want to sit next to this woman right here. I, want to, I, I hear this story, and I think of Gene. I think, man, he got to sit right next to Gene, you know, and celery, and two big homemade chocolate pies to top it off. That's what they spread out there next to you while you sat with your bologna sandwich. But they said to you, why don't we just put it all together? No, I couldn't do that. I couldn't even think of it, you murmured in embarrassment with one eye on their chicken. Oh, come on. There's plenty of chicken and plenty of pie and plenty of everything. And we just love bologna sandwiches. Let's just put it all together. And so you did. And there you sat eating like a king when you came like a pauper. You see, the title of this story is the kingdom of God is like a picnic. And that's what the kingdom of God is like. It's like you and me, who we come bringing what? We're lucky if we come bringing that bologna sandwich. We come bringing next to nothing, and yet God comes bringing a feast. God comes with the entire banquet spread out. And he says, regardless of how little you bring, you are welcome at this feast. You were created for this feast. You were created for this moment. Right now, you were created to be a part of the family of God. And I want you to know every single verse. Because from the door of that orphanage to the house of the king, you're no longer an outcast, but you have a new song to sing. From rags unto riches, from the weak to the strong, you're not worthy to be here, but praise God, you belong. You and me, we have the opportunity to come with just the simple meal that we have and to sit down together in the feast of the kingdom. That's what makes us family. Not that God chose us. You see, each and every one of you by the very fact that you draw breath today. God chose you and God created you. God is the Father who waits for you to choose Him. For you to say, I want to be a part of the family also. I want to come and I realize that all I've got is a bologna sandwich, but I want to come and I want to be a part of the family. And 2 Peter, the first chapter in the fourth verse, it says this in, in ways that sound confusing when you read them, but they're really not that complex. It says, in this way, 
He has given us the very great and precious gifts he promised. What are those great and precious? These are the precious gifts in the third verse it talks about. It says, the divine power of God. Imagine that. The gift that God wants to give you is his divine power, the Holy Spirit. His divine power, his presence in you every single day. His divine power that he will never leave you, never forsake you. He'll be with you to the very end. In this way, he has given us the very great and precious gifts he promised, so that by means of these gifts, you may escape from the destructive lust that is in the world. Are there destructive lusts in the world today? How many of us have been destroyed by the lust of the world? Don't raise your hands, please. <laughs> I mean, we've gone through this. We know what it's like. I mean, have, someone doesn't have to yell at us about it. Someone doesn't have to outline this for it. We've been there, done that. We know what it's like. The destructive lust that is in the world and may come to share in the divine nature. My very favorite translation of this doesn't say may come to share in the divine nature, but it says this. It says, may come to share in the very being of God. You see, when we come, it's just not the divine nature of God, but it's in the very being of God. God wants you to be part of the family so that you can share in the very being. So first of all, it says we choose to belong as family when we accept his gifts as our invitation to family life. When we accept his gifts, as our invitation to family life, it says, in this way, he has given us the very great and precious gifts. These gifts go beyond anything we can ever understand. When you pulled in today, you saw that big blue water slide out there. I plan on going down it today for one sole reason, not because I want to look cooler than everyone else or can't wait to show off my great physique with the weight loss or any of those kind of things. This is the reason I plan to go down it today. Um, my friend Joe Reamer died last year and Joe's wife sold the company after Joe died. It's still called Aloha Joe's. And every year at the picnic time, even last year when Joe was dying, he, hadn't, he wasn't dead yet, he was still a month away. Joe, you gotta have a something for the picnic. I would hit him up to give us something for the picnic until finally he just gave us a water slide, gave us a bounce house. The bounce house we have out there, Joe just gave it. He said, I'm so sick and tired of you asking, Pastor. He just gave them to us. We broke the water slide he gave us. I mean, everything. And so his wife sold the company. I had called the guy who owns the company now, and he didn't call me back until last night. I didn't think I was ever going to get a call back even. Got a call back finally from the guy who owns Aloha Joe's now. His name's Keith. Um, Keith said, yeah, hi, um, this is Keith. I was just calling back the number. What do you need? And I said, well, this is Pastor Eric from Central Community. Um, we need a water slide for our picnic. He said, when is it? He said, tomorrow. He said, oh, man. He said, I'm leaving tomorrow with my church on a missions trip. He said, if I brought it tonight, would that be okay? I have one. I could live with you, but then I'd have to leave it for the entire week. I said, no problem. You can leave it here for the whole week. You can just pay me when I get back if I can pick it up. I said, no problem. That's no problem either. He said, well, where's your church at? What church is it? I said, Central Community on the corner of Phoenix and Arlington. There was this long silence, and I could tell he was processing it. I said, Joe's church, Aloha Joe's church. I said, do you know where we're at? There was a catch in his throat, and he said, well, I was there for the funeral. I was there for the funeral. I said, do you know where to drop it off at? And I said, well, how much is it going to be? And he said, well, it's normally this much, but suddenly it was like <laughs> next to nothing, you know. Joe was dying, literally the day or two before he died. He was holding my hand. I was sitting next to his bed. He couldn't talk anymore, barely and he called me down. I want to tell you something. He said, I'm going to make you wet your pants. <laughs> no one ever said that to me on their deathbed before. Of all the things people have said to me, <laughs> begging about eternity, anything like that, no one ever said they're going to make me wet. What, Joe? <laughs> you know? He said, that's how you're going to know I made it. I'm going to make you wet your pants and you're going to laugh, and you're going to think it's me. And I thought, 
We got a water slide out there today from Joe, and today after service, I'm going to go put on my bathing suit, and I'm going to get up there, and I'm going to cry. I'm going to think about Joe, my friend that I served with for so many years, and who played the drums here at Central Community, and who now, gone 11 months, going to make me wet my shorts out there when I get up there on the thing, and I'll think about it, and I'll think how Joe is home. I mean, Joe's made it. I mean, he told me, that's how you'll know I made it, Eric. That's how you'll know I made it. And I thought, good news. Good news. You see, there's a way that we come if we just accept his gift. And Joe was one of those guys who just accepted the gifts that God had given him. In this way, he has given us his very great and precious gifts as our invitation to family life second. We choose to belong as family when we say yes to his promise in all our problems. When we say yes to his promise in all of our problems. See, because a lot of us, we say yes to his, prom to his promises in some of our problems, but not in all of our problems. There are a lot of our problems we think are the problems we're supposed to fix. We think they're the problems that are supposed to go to God and the problems that we're supposed to take care of. And everyone balances out differently. But here's the deal. Every challenge that you face in life, just as every celebration that you face in life, belongs to God. And the scripture says, He promised. Let's just say that out loud together. He promised. What did he promise? Let's look at the front of your, or at the top of the verse up here. It says, very great and precious gifts that he promised. God promised you these very great and precious gifts, and God keeps his promises. It's not like he's going to say, well, yeah, I've got those gifts for Pastor Eric, but not for you, Steve. It's not like he's going to say, yeah, I've got those gifts for Bobby, but for, not for you, Todd. I mean, it's not like he's points out different. I mean, God has these promises for everyone who's willing to open up and say yes to his promise in all of their problems. Say, God, I need your promise in the heart of my problems. And third, we choose to belong as family when we share openly all that God has given us. When we share openly all that God has given us. You see, it's his. Any of you know some verses by heart that you memorized in Sunday school? Maybe one of them is this. Every good and perfect gift comes from where? Whom? Every good and perfect gift comes from God. Every good and perfect gift comes from God. And that means if it didn't come from God, is it good or perfect? If it didn't come from God, do you want it in your household? No. You see, everything that you want in your household is a gift that came from God, which means if it came from God, who does it belong to? And it means, are we landlords or are we renters here on earth? Friends, we are merely passing through. We are renters. That's the whole deal. We are never landlords here. There is only one landlord of the planet earth. That would be God the Father. The rest of us, we're merely renters. And for us to share openly all that God has given us, because it's his, so that by means of these gifts, you may escape the destructive lust that's in this world. You see, these gifts that God has given us, they're our escape plan. By means of these gifts, we have the opportunity to share openly. I was running yesterday, and I looked down in the gutter as I was running, and I'd been, and I was about I was running too, or day before yesterday, I was running too far, and I looked down and something caught my eye in the gutter. And I realized it was a little cross, and so I stopped, and I bent over, and it was a little black cross, and I thought, oh, that's just like our cross, you know. Up front, you know, it's an awful lot. I wondered if one of those, and then I turned it over, and it was a crucifix. And it had Jesus on it, all in gold. And someone, you know what they call these? They call these a cross in a pocket. So you can always keep these with your change, and you just always... And someone had obviously pulled out some change, probably, and just like you had loose change, had lost a little cross in their pocket, and suddenly Christ was face down in the gutter. 
but the cross remained. And you see, for us to realize, the cross remained. Christ Jesus is no longer on the cross. Christ Jesus is meant to be not on the cross, but where? In our hearts. That's how we come home to the family. And for me, I thought, when I lifted this up, I can't tell you how many things I find on my runs that I think, that'll preach. I look at this, and that's exactly what I thought. I thought to myself, well, that'll preach. And I thought about how many of us have made Christ just a part of our everyday currency to the point that we even forget that that little cross is in our pocket. Because it's not meant to be in your pocket, it's meant to be in your heart in your home, in everything that we do. How do you get to that spot? I love what Arthur Ashe said. Arthur Ashe was the famous what great? What sport? Tennis Tennis great, the famous tennis great. He said, start where you are, use what you have, do what you can. Start where you are, use what you have, do what you can. These words stand out to me because back in the 1970s, I really wanted to learn how to play tennis. It's one of the few sports that I've never really tried or made an effort at. I really decided to make an effort at it. I went to city lessons in the city of Long Beach when I was a college student. In the night, I would go to these city lessons. And I want you to know, I am the world's worst tennis player. The world's worst. If, if you're really bad at tennis, I want to play you someday because I want you to know there's someone worse than you. You can beat me, I guarantee you. I mean. And I excelled at racquetball. I played two years university level racquetball. And so everyone said, you'll be really good at tennis. And it, I don't know what the distance and the racket changed, what it was. It was, everyone tells me the rackets are bigger now, it'll be better, it'll be easier. Don't know. I had a tough time with tennis. I took three lessons and quit. I mean, that's how long it took me to tell that I was bad. Now, you think if I would have taken three years at it as opposed to three lessons, I might have gotten better. But here's the issue. I couldn't stand being bad at a sport. I couldn't stand going out there with a lot of people and looking stupid and being bad. And so I didn't do it. Now, had I stuck with it from my 20s until now, 40 some odd years later, do you think I might enjoy it in my 60s and be out there playing doubles with friends? Sure. But I didn't. I didn't want to look stupid in my 20s. And how many of us? We don't share openly because we don't want to look stupid. We don't let someone know all the verses because we don't want to look stupid. And we don't realize that this spiritual walk, well, it's not a one-mile race, man. This is a marathon. This is your life. You need to start where you are. Use what you have. Do what you can. And you say, man, in my life, the cross isn't even in my pocket yet. Friends, wherever it's at, you have the opportunity to carry it. And finally, we choose to belong as family. When we recognize release as freedom, not bondage. So it says, you may escape. See, here's the problem is we think to ourselves, oh, man, if I come to Christ Jesus, if I get involved in this family of God, and I belong somehow, I'm attached for life. I'm hooked in there. And we don't think about that as freedom, we think about that as bondage. Scriptures say, you may escape. What are you escaping? The destructive lust of these worlds. Now, the lust of these worlds, do they attract us? How many of you like to look at the Best Buy ad on Sundays just to see what might be new in there? How many of you like to follow some deal site online just to see what might be new in there? Like some travel site and think, wow, look where I could go for just $247. How many of you like to look at Pastor Eric's great deal of the day and think, man, you know, follow along. I could go there for this kind of deal. I mean, we all like to dream. But man, if you're losing your life in your dreams, it becomes just a destructive lust of this world, and we have the opportunity to escape that and to just release those things. It says, what you get by achieving your goals is not as important as what you become by achieving your goals. 
See, people always think, like for me, with my weight loss this past 14 months, that the big deal for me is that I'm able to chalk off every single five pounds or 10 pounds that I lost, and that's the big deal for me, or every single time I'm able to tighten my pants a little tighter or get my belt one more notch down. And that's really not at all what it's about. It's about what I become in achieving these goals. I become a different person. And I love the journey of becoming. And for you and me, we have the opportunity to become someone new in achieving our goals, to become someone wondrous in achieving our goals. You see, don't we all have areas of our lives that we realize we need to clean out? That storage unit, that garage, that closet in the extra room, that someplace, and we think, oh man, that so needs to be taken that trunk of your car, that whatever it is in your life that needs to be taken care of, and we just don't address it, and how much more spiritually that part of our heart that we don't let Christ Jesus into, that we don't work with. And so finally, it says we choose to be, belong as family when we come home to his being, because it's where we belong. When we come home to his being, because it's where we belong. And coming home, well, home is where you belong. Home is where you belong, it says, and may come to share in the divine nature. You and me, we have the opportunity to come home and share in the divine nature. We've all heard the story of the prodigal son. The prodigal son who went off to live in the far country, he wasted his father's inheritance. He was living with the pigs. And he finally said, even my father's servants have it better than this. And he decided to go home. And he came home to his father's household. And you remember, he said, Father, I'm not worthy to be called your son. I, I just want to be one of your servants. You know, I've wasted everything that you've given me. And remember what his father did? His father took off his ring, his signet ring, his signature, and he put it on his son. He took off his finest robe and he put it on his son. He said, man, slay the fatted calf. Let's have a picnic. Let's celebrate because my son who is lost is found. We need to have a party. Did the prodigal want to have a party? No, we always talk about prodigals wanting to have parties and they're living their whole life party. It's the father who wants to have a party. See, the father, he's all about celebration. And when you feel like, eh, I'm not so big on partying, you might want to try to figure out where you're at with the father. See, because the father, the father calls us to be with each other in the celebration of everyone coming home together being in the family, celebrating, sharing in these moments that we have. Simple prayer on the bottom of your card this morning says this. Forgive me, God. I've grown so familiar with the world and so far from you. I'm sorry. I'm lonely. I'm ready to come home. I want to discover the joy of the kingdom now and the wonder of knowing my place in your family. Thanks. It's a gift, not just to be able to come home, but to know that home is there. As a family, let's not take home for granted. As a family, let's not take the father for granted. As a family, Let's not take the celebration for granted. But instead, let's share in the celebration and be one in the family. Heavenly Father, we come to you today and we choose family. We thank you for choosing us and creating us. We thank you for making us one, and making us whole. We thank you for inviting us to not just to live in our own nature, God, because you know exactly what we do in our nature, but instead to, 
take a step above and live in your divine nature. We thank you for pulling us out of the mud and on the path towards home. Lord Jesus, for each of us this morning, we would ask that you would come, that you would move in us, that you would make us one, God, that you would somehow draw us together and lift us up, God, into that family that you've created for us and for that one who uniquely feels apart this morning, for that one who feels like they've been caught up in the destructive lust of this world, for that one who feels like the divine nature of you, God, is so far from them that they can't even relate. Lord Jesus, I would ask that you would come, that you would speak uniquely to them, that this might be the time that they would turn their hearts towards you, towards home, and towards family. We thank you, God, for loving us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.